If your experience will be anything like mine, students gave me the roadmap to best serve them, to help them grow in character and leadership, to keep my finger on the pulse of where today's high school athletes are. Not because I had some great strategy, because I listened. Welcome back, everybody, to Leading Through Unprecedented Times, Season 5, and I am so excited to have my good friend Stephen Mackey here. I'm Tom Murray from Future Ready Schools. It's an honor to be with you. Thanks for listening or watching today. Stephen, thank you for joining us. What an opportunity it is for you to share your message with our listeners today. How you doing, my friend? It is good to see you. My man, glad to be with you. Man, so excited from backstage in Harlingen, Texas, to across the screen from you and getting to hang out and encourage educators and leaders across the country. A gift to be with you, my friend. Well, I'll tell you what, you mentioned Harlingen and all our good friends down there in Harlingen from the day that I first met you. You went out, you warmed up the audience a little bit. I think they gave you maybe 10 minutes and I had to follow up with an hour. And the entire time you were speaking, I was thinking to myself, there is no way that I can follow this dude right here because you captivated him in 10 minutes. And I'm like, all right, well, I guess the uh, the varsity's going first today and I'll just kind of bring up the rear a little bit. Hopefully I didn't let him down too much. But no, what an honor it is to connect. I've, I've really enjoyed getting to know you in the last couple of years from your work, from being an author, just the, the work that you're doing around the country. You know, speaking of, here we are, summertime, kind of looking forward to next year. I know you're going to be, you got lots of convocations happening, a lot of things coming up. One of the things you talk about in convocations that I get to, to listen to that I absolutely love, it's around this notion of building a culture of character. This is so much your message, curriculum, all sorts of things. But let's focus on that as, as we kind of look through the summer into next year. You know, principals that are listening, superintendents that are listening, number one, it is such a need, creating this culture of character, right? Talk to us about your your message there. I mean, part of that message you might share with the staff coming up in the next couple of months. What does that look like? What does that mean to you? We all know that character is important. In fact, most schools have some mandate from the state or the district to do character education. But because it's so common, we don't always give it the intentionality that it deserves. And as a result, we talk about integrity, 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 kindness, kindness, kindness. And because we talk about it so much and it's mandated, we just assume that everybody knows how to do it. And importance doesn't equal uh, integration, right? Uh, it doesn't mean that students know how to do it. I I'll give you an example. The, the other day at my son's Little League game, we have a bunch of first year players and, and one of the coaches told the kid as he walked up to the plate, hey, be aggressive at the plate. And we tell him to be aggressive all the time. Get up there and be aggressive. And the kid looks at coach and says, okay. And then he walks, takes two steps, turns around and says, coach, what's aggressive mean? <laughs> and, and a lot of times the same thing happens with character, integrity, integrity, integrity. Okay, great. But how do I do it? And so the message is to say that we need to place the same intentionality on teaching students how to build the muscle of integrity, the muscle of discipline, the same that we do that we teach them how to build mathematics. And the reason is because character is what I call a talent amplifier. And it has a way of amplifying all the other things that we do. Because when you have great work ethic, well, then you get more out of the work that you do. When you're a person of integrity and you build that integrity muscle through telling the truth and taking responsibility and making commitments that count, well, that has a way of amplifying and continuing on long after whatever context they originally learned it in. And so when we talk about building a culture of character, we don't just talk about uh, celebrating character or even talking about it. We want, we want it to be a talent that is developed, uh, a skill that is developed just like anything else. 
Yeah, I love that. You know, Stephen, you are so well known in the state of Texas, working with athletics, working with coaches, and maybe I'm a high school principal is li- listening to this. Maybe I'm a superintendent listening to this. And your work with some of your and some of your work with 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 coaches um, around character development, leadership development. It's so much of what you do. Speak to superintendents and principals. Besides, obviously, they can certainly bring you in to support them with the work. Obviously, that's that's really what you do. Um, but as you have expanded your message throughout the nation in, in recent years, talk to the them about ways to, to work with their coaches to help bring out the character development, the leadership development. Because as a former principal, as a former person at district office, many times there's a disconnect there between our coaches. And so talk to us a little bit about the work, the advice that you have in that area and how school and district leaders can support their coaches in some of the areas that you're working. Sure. And so the, the thing that coaches who don't intentionally do character development and leadership development say is I don't have time. I don't have time for it. Well, we're, we're, we're too intent and we've really got to figure out the strategy and the technique and we really got to get on the field or the court to do this. And, and the challenge is to say that some things have to be mandatory and some things they have to be placed as a priority. And part of the reason that we're not too, that we're too intent is because we're not handling the foundational stuff. And so then all of the extra uh, doesn't have anything to land upon. Um, and, and so when you say, well, what does that, what does that look like? Well, from a district point of view, you might uh, place uh, evaluation or assessment on a coach at 40% on the on-field performance and 60% on the player person development, on the character, on the community service, on uh, what, what it's like, how students are developed. And by, by spreading out it, that, that assessment, what it communicates is that wins matter, but helping kids win in life matters more. And, and, and you may get a, if you could get a 55 out of 60 on that player development, well, what you're going to find is that that talent is going to get better and it's going to communicate to that coach just how important uh, that is. For the coach themselves to say, we've got to make time for this. You make time for weights, make time for conditioning because you know how important they are. Well, we have to also make time for character development. And that can look like a curriculum. Happen to know a guy who has one. It's pretty good. Uh, But it can also look like spending time with your captains and then giving your captains time to to lead their teammates. Uh, And so you can in the process of developing character, develop your leaders at the same time, which is something every coach knows they need is, is, is a player led team. And so these things can go together. They don't have to be separate. They can, they can stack on each other and, and you can reach multiple goals. Yeah, no. Well, I will say you kind of stole my thunder with the next thing that I wanted to ask you about was that curriculum, because maybe I'm that high school principal or that superintendent. And I, I can just turn to my coaches and say, like, go build character, like, good luck. And then I check it off my little box. Well, I told them, right? And we all know how successful that's going to be. But you've actually created a, a curriculum for folks to use widespread in the state of Texas and certainly growing throughout the nation here. Talk to us a little bit about that, um, what it looks like, just some key takeaways, who it's intended for. I know there's some SEL connections to that as well. Certainly something that's been a, a need throughout our country. So talk to us a little bit about that, what it looks like and how folks can benefit. Sure. So what we use and the way that we do our our curriculum is actually a great game plan and a model for if you don't want to use a curriculum and you want to do the work and you want to do it yourself, you can follow the same model that we've laid out. Our our character and leadership development curriculum is a video based SEL based curriculum. We've got 36 lessons a year where I teach the character trait, leadership trait of the week defined and described by two words. And those two words each week become a theme or a mnemonic so that all that is talked about in the lesson can be recalled in two words. And so rather than having a checkbox of this week is integrity, this week is respect, well, we we couch it inside that classroom of athletics and apply it first to athletics because we want to win and we want to get better on the field. And then we make the connection to the classroom and then to life all within this seven to 10 minute container that's defined and described by two words. 
For example, if we were talking about sacrifice, well, the two words might be sacrifice required. And we would say that there's a lot of things in life that are optional, coming from the right family or the right home, the right school, being the, the right size. Those things are optional. A lot of too small people in the NFL, a lot of too short people in the NBA. But the one thing that's not optional is sacrifice, sacrifice required. And as coaches talk about that theme to say, hey, there's sacrifice that is required to get stronger, to win the game on the field. Well, those same two words can be shared by coach as they step and see a student in the hallway and they step into the classroom and say, hey, sacrifice is required, sacrifice required in chemistry. You know what? You're going to have to sacrifice joking at the back of the room and go sit at the front and take notes. You have to sacrifice that na that nap in third period to focus and ask questions if you want to be successful in the classroom. But the beauty is that the same soft skills, the same character talent that's required to be successful in sports, the same skill sets that are required to be successful in the classroom, the discipline, the work ethic, the planning, the goal setting, the belief, all of that, it's a one-to-one -one into the classroom. It's just a different field of competition. And once we get it in athletics, we can get it in the classroom. To get in the classroom, we get it in the hallway. Get the hallway, we get the house. Get the house, we get it for the rest of our life. And so we set this seven to 10 minute video lesson that I teach, define and describe by two words. And then the next step is that we wanna hit four different areas. We wanna hit our coaches, our captains, our athletes, and our families. And so each week in our curriculum, we have a lesson for the coaches that builds on the video that's like a weekly staff development and has three things to be on the lookout for that's gonna help the coach coach beyond the game. And this matters as you think about how you build out your character program because we can't outsource development to the curriculum, that we can't remove the value of the coach. Instead, the curriculum has to support and make it easier for the coach to coach. Um, and so we have this weekly staff development piece for the coach to equip them to be able to go beyond the game. For the captains, we answer the question in light of this week's lesson, how can I go be a leader? Uh, because it does no good to have these high expectations of leadership for students, if there's not an equal amount of or a proportional amount of equipping and encouragement. Uh, students tell me all the time, everybody tells me I'm a leader, but they've not taught me how to lead. And it's really overwhelming. And so as we place that expectation on students, we want to also give them the equipping and the encouragement to go and lead. That's what this section does. There's an athlete section that answers the question, why does it pay to have great character? Why should I go the long way instead of lo looking for a shortcut or a hack? Uh, because again, all of this, that's why we start in athletics because there's that, it, that character amplifies your talent and you're able to see ha having and playing with character actually makes you better. It pays to do it. And then we can make this connection to life. And then the family section, we want to invite the family into the process. And so we make our curriculum available for free to any adult connected to the, to the school. Uh, and then we give them a, an, a one page encouragement to let them know what we're talking about and some questions that they can ask to keep the conversation going. We do this 36 times a year and every year we create new lessons so that as students walk through their athletic career, they have over the course from seventh grade to 12, you know, over over 200 unique character and leadership lessons that are SEL based that have a one to one application to athletics, but will last and serve as a foundation beyond athletics. You can use that framework, regardless of whether or not you use our curriculum as a way to think about how you develop uh, character and leadership in a program. Yeah, no, I love that. Thank you for sharing that framework with us. And, you know, I can see our principals about to hit send to their, their, uh, to their coaches saying, you got to listen to this podcast. You got to listen to this Mackie guy. What do you start? Are we doing any of that? What's that look like? So here's my question for you. And I'll, and I'll be completely real and honest, you know, having played high school and college sports, I don't remember. And I don't, I don't do this. I, I went to a great high school and, and a great college and I don't do this to throw them under the bus. 
I don't really remember one time having these conversations as an athlete. If I messed it up, my butt was running around the field. And that's that's kind of how I learned my lesson per se, right? But it's got to be so much more than that. And recognizing the people that are taking the field, they're somebody's future mom, somebody's future dad, a future spouse, right? And when 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 you're sharing this message, what does it look like when you see um, schools and programs that are implementing these conversations well? Is this typically, and I know it can take all different shapes and forms, is this typically a conversation before practice? Is this on a bus ride home after a game? Like, when do you see these kinds of conversations taking place so they're really meaningful and relevant? So let's go back to where we started. And we said, that this must be intentional and it must be prioritized. Uh, what you described in your experience is the unintentional character development of athletics. When coaches say sports uh, intuitively, uh, just by being a part of it teaches character. And coaches say, I'm a great person. And so I'll use this great classroom. I'm a great person and you'll learn character. That's the modeling piece of what's called life skill transfer. Uh, that's the modeling piece. And that's important. But to stop there uh, doesn't get us very far. I, I don't know um, how to swim. And I can watch Michael Phelps swim all day long, a perfect model. But the moment that, that, that my 312 pound self jumps in the pool, you know what happens? I sink to the bottom because nobody ever taught me how to swim. I had a great model, but I wasn't taught how to do it. And so I sunk. Same thing with character and leadership development. We start with the modeling, but then we continue on to the teaching. And then from the teaching, we move as we teach with language and with uh, conversation, then we move to the testing. And that's where we give students meaningful opportunities to take ownership and to practice what we've taught them both in athletics and outside of athletics with those that they're connected to athletics with. That's their teammates going and doing community service. That's them uh, applying what they learn athletics into the classroom. Um, and then we reward it uh, because what gets rewarded gets repeated. And so this model, teach, test, reward uh, framework is how we can take the classroom of athletics and actually not give the experience that you have, but let students grow from it. So where does the teaching take place? That's your question. What I recommend is that you select a time each week that can be your character and leadership development time. Um, in Texas, we have athletic periods. And so that means the teams are together during the school day. And so what we recommend is on Monday, first day of the week, first athletic period, that's your character and leadership time. And, and our program can be done in as little as 12 minutes a week. Uh, so it doesn't have to be uh, a quantity thing so long as it's a quality thing. Uh, but you select that time every week, Monday, first period, the first 12 minutes. Uh, we watch the video, we have the talk, we set the theme for the week. And then you take time each day and it can be concurrent with stretching, with roll call, um, as, a, as a station, as you're rotating through weights, uh, that you can work it into things that you're already doing uh, to continue that conversation. So what we might do using our framework is teach the lesson, watch the video on Monday. Um, on Tuesday, take 10 minutes to talk about the captains and what it's like to lead. On Wednesday, take 10 minutes to talk about how to make it personal, why it pays to have character. On Thursday, we might take 10 minutes to talk about the team as a family, because we know that not all athletes have the family life at home where they're going in the support, where they talk about how to be a husband or a wife or a father or a mother. And so we talk about the team as a family. And then on Friday, we take 10 minutes to have three students share for three minutes about what this week's lesson meant to us. Now, that's 10 minutes a day, 50 minutes across the week. There was zero planning done there, but what there was done, what there was, was a prioritization and an intentionality about it using the framework, lesson, leadership, personal, family, and then let's share out. Uh, and so that's a way that that teaching can be done. 
Yeah, I have to also tell you, I'm having a little guilt as I'm listening to you. I was uh, when I was a, an assistant principal at the middle school level. I was also in charge of overseeing athletics, and part of it, I was just trying to survive. Right, is the game happening? Is it not? And I'm not so sure as a building leader, I really had conversations with my coaches on how we were growing our athletes in these areas. You know, you just said, hey, we've got a period. And I know if I'm if I'm a principal in the Northeast saying, wait, they have what in Texas? A period with their, t- their kids together. We don't get that in the Northeast. And maybe they said that, but recognize and realizing we've got to prioritize because we are continuing to grow the character, uh, the leadership. And if we want them to go play college ball, we want them to go be a good father or mother someday down the road. Every day is an opportunity to teach them those skills, not assume that they're just going to take it out from that model, which of course, like you said, is important as well. You know, one of the things I respect about your work is how closely you work with students. And I know you've done a lot of student interviews to get at some of the heart of these pieces. Talk to us a little bit about that, what you've uncovered from working directly with students and some the interviews you've done? As this was really a result of coming out of COVID and, and just having to reset, like we all did, having to reset on everything. And, and so what I wanted to do is I wanted to know where students were at, because as we continued creating these lessons that are motivational, uh, that are educational, that are challenging and are helping to lay this foundation, I wanted to know where are students at and how can I best serve them? And this amazing thing happens is that when we as adults shut up and listen to students, we realize that they are experts on themselves. They know exactly what's going on. Now, they may not know what to do about it, but they know exactly what's going on. And so what I did was I I invited um, about 24 students from across the state of Texas to hop on a Zoom call with me. And I sent them a list of about 25 questions. And we just had a conversation. We jumped into some breakout rooms and we had conversations about what was going on in their world. And as we visited, it was amazing to hear students share stuff that they were almost afraid to share with other adults in their lives. Um, and, and that really is the basis. And now we do this quarterly and it's the basis of the content for our curriculum. Our curriculum in that sense is student driven because we listen to students to hear the issues, the situations, the struggles that they are going through and that they have. And then we respond to those and, and we help focus. But, you know, it's, it's things like it's things that we know, but to hear is really challenging. I ask students, what's the feeling you feel most often? And across the board, students tell me, I feel overwhelmed. I'm worried. I'm stressed. I'm anxious. I'm just doing whatever I can do to try to make it, to relieve just enough pressure to make it to tomorrow. And these are students who are highly engaged, who have high levels of, uh, of performance. These are, these are the best of the best. When I interview and ask coaches to send me athletes to interview, they don't send me the third string JV guys. They send me their all-stars. And the all-stars are saying, I'm overwhelmed, I'm stressed, I'm worried, I'm anxious. The pressure is everywhere. And we're doing whatever we can do just to, to make it to tomorrow. Uh, Now, when you hear that, we know it's true. We know mental health is an issue. We know it's a big deal. But to hear students say it puts, makes it a little bit more, puts a sharper tip on it. You go, okay, what we do really matters. The the math and the, the chemistry and all of that matters. But what really matters is loving on and raising up young men and women. And we just get to do it in the classroom of, mathematics or or chemistry or athletics. Yeah, I love that. You know, another thing, and I appreciate you sharing your wisdom on that and helping us think through that. Um, One of the things I also wanted to ask you about, you wrote a book recently, a recent release with one of our mutual, really good friends, Damon West. Uh, Damon and I enjoyed a nice steak dinner recently, a good friend of ours. And, you know, you and Damon got together to write the book. It's called The Locker Room, How Great Teams Heal Hurt, Overcome Adversity, 
and build unity. And I love that title, but in reading the book and connecting with the book, um, one head of there's some of the athletic directors I've coached, I've said, Hey, you've got to check this book out. And I appreciate you sending them some copies, signed copies, my man. Thank you for that. Um, but it goes beyond just being a coach or an athletic director, because if I'm thinking about principals, if I'm thinking about superintendents, other district leaders, this notion of, and we can use the sports analogy of the locker room, but how great teams heal hurt. Let's be real. There's been a lot of trauma in our world, a lot of hurt and struggles in our world, how they overcome adversity. I mean, that's that's been the topic of leading through unprecedented times since two weeks into COVID starting and this notion of how we overcome adversity, but also to build unity. And man, is our world so divided today, left versus right, red versus blue, you know, just all those different pieces. Talk to us about the book a little bit, but how school and district leaders and coaches may be able to, to use that, leverage that as an incredible resource for their own growth, but to also grow those that they work with. The, the book, The Locker Room, came out of uh, during the summer, the summer right after the lockdown started and, and was sitting there thinking, just looking at all that division. And I said, you know, if America had a locker room, we wouldn't have all the problems that we have. Because something happens. I call it the miracle of the locker room. It's the sense that the people from all different backgrounds, all different histories and hurts and hangups, all kinds of folks come together for one common goal. And, and when, they're in, when you're in a locker room, a healthy locker room, then you don't look at each other's differences as an obstacle that has to be overcome, but you look at it as your strength to overcome obstacles. You go, man, what Tom has is a different strength than what I have, but I'm not going to one down myself because I'm not him. I'm going to go, man, I'm glad that he's on my team and I'm going to leverage your strength. And you're going to look over here and go, man, I wish I, I don't have to wish I was like Mackie. I can just be thankful that he's on my team and our differences, they become our strength uh, that, that in a locker room, that when you make a mistake, it doesn't make you a mistake. That that our success is connected. Your success is my success and my success is yours. And so when you make a mistake, I'm not going to put you down. I'm not going to hold you down or, 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 or any of that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to lift you up because I can't be successful without you being successful in a healthy locker room. And so as we thought about all these things, I just said, man, wouldn't it be amazing? Wouldn't it be great to write a simple parable, a teaching story uh, uh, about the power of a locker room. And so I reached out to Damon West. We weren't friends at the time. Now we're great friends. And, and, uh, and I pitched him on the idea. And that was July 3rd, 2021. Uh, 20, uh, and, and so I, it came out and, and we wrote it really, really quickly. Uh, and, and actually 10 months and 13 days from the idea of the book, we were on the Wall Street Journal bestsellers uh, and, and, and debuted there. And it was just an incredible, an incredible journey. Uh, but I think the power of the book is that it shows us the simple idea that anytime we take our eyes off our core values, uh, that foundation of character, that whenever we take our eyes off of that, adversity, conflict, and hurt will always follow. That whenever we uh, outsource our mistakes, whenever we fail to live in integrity, whenever we lack respect, uh, whenever we, are, we aren't committed to our goals the way that we say that we're committed to, adversity, conflict, and hurt will always follow. But whenever we keep our eyes on our core values, uh, what happens is that it really doesn't matter what obstacles in front of us. When we chase after those core values, we can overcome them. Um, it doesn't matter the hurt. It doesn't matter the circumstance. When we are laser focused on our core values, that foundation of character, we always find a way through together. Because whatever patience is required, whatever respect is required, the respect to listen and to have hard conversations, whatever commitment to, to growing uh, and, and learning from our mistakes, those things are there and we overcome them. And so it's a, it's a short book about the power of character uh, and, and its effect to not just focus our efforts and amplify our talents, but its ability as we focus in on it to help us heal hurts, overcome adversity and build unity. 
Mm, I love that. Some really deep thoughts there. I love the connection to that. Incredible book. And congrats on that, the Wall Street Journal status. That's incredible, my friend. I'm proud of you for that. You know, two of the things I'm going to ask you for a piece of advice as we wrap up, no matter who's listening, where they fall, that's coming. So think about that. But two of the things you have me thinking about, one of the statements you said early on is character is a talent amplifier. And I absolutely love that. I haven't thought of it like that. I haven't heard of that before. I think that's absolutely brilliant. I love that. And I think one of the, the last things that you just said um, is so incredibly deep and, and it hits for all our school and district leaders at the heart of their culture. And it's when we take our eyes off of our core values, adversity, hurt, and conflict will be there, however you phrased it at the end, but incredibly deep, incredible thoughts there. And just, you have me reflecting on that as, as a dad, as a school leader, um, just in my world there. So, so final piece here, before I ask you how folks can reach out and get connected with you as well, but no matter where they are, no matter what state they're listening to, whether they knew of you today or that before, this is your, their first connection with you, whether they're a superintendent or a principal, we've talked about a lot of different pieces as we work through the summer here, as they look at launching next year, what's one piece of advice you have for them, regardless of their role, based on some of the things you've said today? The best piece of advice that I could give is I would say, listen to your students, create space for them to be experts on themselves, to genuinely let them take ownership in their development, in their education, in their in, in in loving in the pride of their district, and 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 when they speak, listen to them. Just listen. Don't be defensive. Don't try to prove that you're right. Just listen, and if you will, uh, I think that they'll give you the roadmap to reach all of the goals that your district has. Uh, if your experience will be anything like mine, students gave me the roadmap to best serve them, to help them grow in character and leadership, to keep my finger on the pulse of where today's high school athletes are. Uh, be not because I had some great strategy, because I listened. Uh, and so I think the same thing can happen for you. If you don't have a superintendent's council, have a superintendent's council, a principal's council, um, a, a representative of your student population where they can speak freely and openly um, and truthfully about their experience, knowing that you will listen and that it will influence your actions. Uh, you do that and I don't think you can go wrong. Yeah, incredible words, my friend. So for those folks that are, are listening, how can they reach out? Where can they follow you? The best and easiest way to find out about everything I do is at Mackie Speaks dot com m a c k e y mackiespeaks.com there you can find contact information if you'd like for me to come do uh, convocation or staff development for teachers or for coaches um, or to speak to your athletes um, you'll find information about our curriculum it's called two words character development uh, but it's easy enough just to click on the link at mackiespeaks.com and you can find uh, links to the locker room book um, which you can get Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, or your independent book store. Awesome. And we'll be sure to put those links down here in the podcast notes as well. That's Stephen Mackey, everybody. My man, thank you so much for your time. Great to see you today. Thanks, brother. Continue the great work. 